I know what it means to be called the N-word. I know what it means to be called the F word. And I can sum up the difference in one word. None. Melvin Boozer was born on June 21st, 1045 in Washington, DC. The son of a domestic worker and janitor, Boozer grew up in DC and graduated salutorian of his high school class and earned a scholarship to Dartmouth College where he studied sociology. He spent three years in the Peace Corps in Brazil before completing his graduate studies. Returning to the United States, Boozer received a PhD from Yale University and became a professor of sociology at the University of Maryland. In 1979, Boozer became the first African-American elected president of the Gay Activist Alliance of Washington, D.C. Under his leadership and in collaboration with Frank Kameny, the GAA secured passage of the D.C. Sexual Reform Act, which decriminalized sodomy and struck down other anti-gay laws. The GAA also sued the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority and won the right to display Metro bus posters announcing, someone in your life is gay. In 1980, the Socialist Party nominated Boozer for Vice President of the United States. The Democratic Party followed suit and nominated Boozer by petition. Though not elected, Boozer became the first ever openly gay U.S. Vice Presidential candidate. In his prime time televised speech at the Democratic National Convention, Boozer called attention to discrimination against LGBT and black Americans. Bigotry is bigotry. Discrimination is discrimination. I believe that there is no power on this earth that can defeat the American people as long as we remain true to the values which have made us great. In 1981, Boozer co-founded and led the Langston Hughes Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club, which advocated for black gays and lesbians in Washington, D.C. Later in his life, he became an AIDS activist. In 1987, Melvin Boozer died of an AIDS-related illness at the age of 41. Melvin Boozer's contributions to civil rights and social consciousness still live on to this day. And for that, he is a hero. Anna Pauline Pauli Murray was born in 1910 and passed in 1985. Murray was an American civil rights activist who became a lawyer, a women's rights activist, an Episcopal priest, and an author. Drawn to the ministry in 1977, Murray was the first African-American woman to be ordained as an Episcopal priest in the first year that any women were ordained by that church. Murray expressed on multiple occasions a desire to be identified as male, and many recent biographers have used male or non-binary pronouns, so we would join these scholars in using they-them pronouns for Murray. In quoting Murray's writing, we will also use the racial descriptor of Negro, as this was the contemporary term they used. Murray was the only person identified as a woman in their law school class at Howard University and graduated first in their class. Traditionally, men who graduated first in their class were awarded the Julius Rosenwald Fellowships for graduate work at Harvard University, but the university did not accept a woman. Murray was rejected despite a letter of support from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. They wrote in their response, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds. Are you to tell me that one is more difficult than the other? In 1950, Murray published State's Law on Race and Color, an examination and critique of state segregation laws throughout the nation. Murray argued for civil rights lawyers to challenge the state segregation laws as unconstitutional directly, rather than trying to prove the inequity of so-called separate but equal facilities. In 1963, Murray became one of the first to criticize the sexism of the civil rights movement. In their speech, The Negro Woman in the Quest for Equality. In a letter to civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph, they criticized the fact that in 1963 March on Washington, no women were invited to make one of the major speeches or to be a part of its delegation of leaders who went to the White House. Among other grievances, they wrote, I have been increasingly perturbed over the blatant disparity between the major role of which Negro women have played and are playing in the crucial grassroots levels of our struggle and the minor role of leadership that they have been assigned in the national policy-making decisions. It is indefensible to call a national march on Washington and to send out a call which contains the name of not a single woman leader. In 1966, Murray co-founded NOW, the National Organization for Women. Lawyer and later Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg credited Polly Murray as a co-author in Ginsburg's brief, Reed vs. Reed, a 1971 Supreme Court case that the first time extended the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause to women. It's got to stop somewhere, and it won't unless someone steps forward and takes a stand. I guess that's me. Lady Java was born in 1943 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Through the support of her mother, Java transitioned at an early age and began dancing and singing at local nightclubs. 
1965, she relocated to Los Angeles, California, where she became an underground celebrity for the nightclub circuit. In the early fall of 1967, after a successful two-week engagement at Red Fox's club, which Java was seeking to extend, the LAPD began shutting down Java's performances, citing rule number nine, a local ordinance prohibiting the impersonation by means of costume or dress, a person of the opposite sex, and threatening to find clubs that hosted her. Fox bowed to the intimidation and canceled Lady Java's act. Recognizing this as a violation of her rights, Lady Java organized public rallies, protests, and pickets that received coverage by Jet Magazine and the LA Advocate. She also joined force with the ACLU to argue that the law was unconstitutional and took away her income. Her legal challenge, however, did not proceed because only the club owners could file a claim and nobody did. Even though la the lawsuit was dismissed based on this technicality, Lady Java is a trailblazer who blazed the way for rule number nine to be struck down two years later. Barbara Smith is a legendary black lesbian feminist, scholar, activist, and writer, still living and committed to her work. She has been speaking truth to power for decades as a woman against misogyny, as an African-American against racism, as a lesbian against homophobia, and as a black lesbian against those in the gay rights movement who sidelined the concerns of LGBTQ people of color. Barbara and her colleagues in the Kambahi River Collective are credited with originating the term identity politics, defining it as an inclusive political analysis for contesting the interlocking oppressions of race, gender, class, and sexuality. This analytical approach served as a precursor to the current model of intersectionality. Smith was a leader in defining and establishing the field of Black women's studies in the United States, beginning with her 1977 essay, Toward a Black Feminist Criticism, which opened the door to serious critical consideration of Black women writers. Her work created new attention for once neglected authors, including Central Florida's own Zora Neale Hurston. With her friend Audre Lorde, Smith co-founded Kitchen Table Women of Color Press in 1980, which was one of the first independent presses in the country committed to publishing the writings of women of color. Barbara Smith served on the Albany, New York Common Council from 2005 to 2013, where she focused her work on youth development, violence prevention, and educational opportunities. She continues her work through the establishing and implementing of Albany's equity agenda, which uses innovative approaches to address poverty, joblessness, racial disparity, and other types of marginalization.